Hi, good evening everyone, and I'm so happy to see so much of you in this very hot summer evening coming together in this very small and warm room in the Bali, but it's not uh, for something uh, general, it's for a very special event of course. Tonight we are launching the fifth wave, um, the magazine of Russian writers in exile uh, that is made by Maxim Osipov together with uh, publishing house Van Oorschot, and tonight you will hear all about this magazine, how, it's, uh, how it came to be and what the role is of Russian writers in exile in this day and age, um, also with regards of the war, of course. Um, and I will now give the floor to Mark Peters, director and publisher of Van Oorschot. Thank you. I still need my glasses. I printed it very big, but, but still. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. This special evening, like Sophie said, we will be launching the first volume of the Fifth Wave. I have both editions here. The magazine for independent Russian writing. Thank you, Sophie, and the Bali for giving us this platform. Last year, our editor, Frederike Doppelberg, you've all seen her yesterday in Nieuwsuur, of course, returned from the Turin Book Fair with a brilliant idea. An idea that was born during a conversation with a literary agent on how a lot of modern Russian authors, either in Russia or in exile, are rapidly losing the possibility to freely publish their work. Authors who are united in their rejection of war and totalitarianism. I cut that from the back of this magazine. I will normally not use these difficult words. It reminded her of the German authors that were forced to flee their country from 1933 onwards and publish their books, for instance, in Amsterdam with exile publishers like Kiridos Verlag or Aller Te Lange. That combined with the fact that Van Oorschot is the main publisher in the Netherlands for Russian literature and, most importantly, the publisher of Maxim Osipov, who, as you know, has been published in many countries and is very successful in the Netherlands. That resulted in the start of the project, The Fifth Wave. The title, by the way, was given to us by Maxime, and it is spot on. Maxime didn't need to be convinced of the importance of the idea, and soon set to work together with publisher Menno Hartmann and Frederike Doppelberg. Of course, our main concern at that time was how to finance such an enormous and risky project. Luckily, people like Hans Boto von Portakius and Jan Moito were willingly helping us financially. And it was the great support from the Ludo Peters Gastschrijversfonds, a fund within the Prince Bernhard Kulturfonds, that gave us the possibility to definitely go ahead. We are, of course, immensely thankful for their help and belief in the project. Maxim Osipov, now living in Amsterdam, is not only a brilliant author, and I assume also a brilliant doctor. I'm no patient of his, so <laughs> thank God you, for you, probably. But he's also been a publisher himself for many years. He has a vast network of authors and other artists. And this resulted in these two beautiful issues with great st short stories, poems, and essays in less than a year, which is quite an achievement. I'm proud to be the publisher of this important magazine, and again wish to thank Editor-in-Chief Maxim Osipov, all the contributing authors and our benefactors for making it possible. And I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I would now love to invite Ellen Rutten uh, to the stage. She is a professor of literature and also the chair of the Slavonic department at the UVA. Welcome. Thanks. Have a seat. Yeah. Um, we are here at the launch of the magazine, uh, Fifth Wave. What is the meaning of this to you, to have this magazine of Russian writers in exile? Um. I think it's meaningful in several respects. Um, uh, I was thinking also of how the presentation was framed. So we also spoke about it uh, 
And I remember uh, also at previous events at the, the Bali, there was often talk of Russian dissidents. That's mm -hmm. not a term that I particularly like. I know that Maxim doesn't like it. I'm double checking now. <laughs> <laughs> He's smiling, <laughs> not sure what it means. <laughs> I remember that he said he doesn't, uh, because that's really a historical term uh, for this very specific group of literary writers who came uh, from Russia to elsewhere in the Soviet period and who were against the mm. regime. But what we see now, and I think it's very important that Maxim is uniting that in the journal, is a group of people who call themselves uh, often relocanti. This is also in the title of one of the contributions in your journal by Alec Likmanov, one of the writers. So relocant, I saw in the English title also. So people who do not um, think of themselves so much as people who are who have fled Russia and who are now only all the time, full-time fighting the regime. Like activists. Like activists, but who left Russia because they want to continue doing their work, high-quality work, um, and who want to be able to do so free from to totalitarian context and to speak out against the war also. And I think it's very important that uh, Maxim created this journal um, uh, with the, the help of Van Oorschot and as a Van Oorschot publication, also because he's doing so in a very difficult period. Uh, it's called Fifth Wave, this journal. There have been other waves of Russian uh, emigration, but this particular wave is a wave of emigration in which Russian migrants have to deal with the fact that they are bearers of a language and a passport of an aggressor in yeah. a very aggressive political war. And this leads to feelings of complicity and shame and guilt ne next to all the other problems of emigration. Um, I read in an, uh, in an interview with you almost a year ago that there were some students uh, that you thought and they said we are speaking the language of the oppressor. Yes, so you really see that this is a big issue for many Russian writers right now. It also leads to Russian boycotts. We can talk about that separately if you want mm -hmm. or we can't. Um, it's a more complex problem than people often think, um, but it's also unfair and unjust and very tragic. And I think in the face of these extra problems, it's extra difficult and extra important that there are institutions like uh, Free Russia NL, I see Katrina, uh, Kristina Petrashova here from Free Russia NL, like Moscow Times, which is also based in Amsterdam, and like Fifth Wave, which are in themselves important, so Fifth Wave is a good literary journal with excellent writers. That's in itself very important. <laughs> it's not uh, a journal of dissidents because they are ideological, like ideologically courageous and that's it, but it's just a good journal. Uh, and it's created at a time when it's not so easy even just to speak, <laughs> to just write in Russian and to continue doing yeah. your work uh, and, and to defend civic society. Because I do think that's very clearly also from how the journal presents itself, clearly also an aim of the journal. Because you also had some colleagues uh, of you who were Russian, who are Russian, who said, I would understand it if you wouldn't want to work with me anymore. Yes, uh, absolutely. And these Russian boycotts, yeah, that's why I just said we can't, uh, uh, this is probably not the evening to talk about it very long. It's not a very happy topic. But uh, I'm editor in journal, uh, editor in chief of a journal called Russian Literature. It will, by the way, be called Slavic Literature soon, but that's not because of boycotts, <laughs> but because we also publish materials on Ukrainian and Belarusian and other literatures. That's not possible anymore under the Noma Russian. Um, but um, for this journal, indeed, we got such messages. But, but also um, on Facebook, you see many discussions now and on other social media platforms of Russian writers saying, I don't know how to write. Use my voice. Yeah. Yes, I just don't know how to write anymore. And it's so important that there are still platforms like this one and new platforms where people can do that and where from abroad... I understood from conversations, Maxime, with you that the idea is also that, of course, this trickles back also via the online publications into, into Russia. Russia. That's itself. another very important yeah. aim, I think. Yeah. So it's actually also really brave of the, the people who contributed to the, the volume that they are writing and... Yeah, and this would be also one of my questions to Maxim. You will probably speak about it later, Maxim. I understood that there are also people writing for the journal from Russia. Uh, and then I looked at the list of contributors. I thought they will probably be enlisted as anonymous, but nobody was anonymous. <laughs> of some of these writers, I know where they are and I know that they fled, but I'm curious. So if people, does this mean there are no people writing in Russia right now? You use the word war on your website. Or are there writers yeah. who say, you know, I'm 85, I don't care? Maybe, <laughs> so I'm curious. Yeah, but maybe that's it's good maybe to, for later. to have some uh, comments on that. Okay.
Well, we have two authors uh, from Moscow in the first volume. Uh, who are now in, in Moscow. Who are now in Moscow. It's Gugolev and Eisenberg. Uh, we have a couple anonymous uh, people who are not uh, writing, but they uh, editing and mm -hmm. proofreading, and they didn't want uh, their names to be disclosed. Uh, at the second volume, we have uh, two people who are in Russia who are in prison. It's Evgenia Berkovich, mm -hmm. uh, who submitted her collection of uh, poems before she was imprisoned. And it is Ilya Yashin, who is not a writer, actually, but he is a politician uh, who got eight and a half years sentence for fighting the war. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for saying speeches against the war, actually. Uh, and there is one person also who lives in Moscow. So it's, it's a mixture. You know, we have uh, in, the, in the second volume, we have people from Israel, from Japan, from two people from New York. So Russian language, actually, when you say you are, you know, the, your colleague mentioned someone who said, uh, you know, the language of uh, the enemy, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's a language of the victim too, because there are many Ukrainians for for whom Russian language is their yeah. mother tongue, and there are people. And of course, from, many Russians who are victims of the war. Yeah, yeah, that's too. And there are also people who who live in New York and who are Americans, but who who yeah. uh, they speak Russian, they uh, you know read Russian, they write in Russian. Uh, our maybe one of the best poets. Uh, uh, is Alexei Tsvetkov, who died uh, last year. He lived uh, most of his uh, life outside of Russia. So Russian language doesn't belong to the state. It doesn't belong to the country. Even. Yeah, and I think what is maybe important to add Thank is you, I wasn't necessarily... No, 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 no worries, that's important. But I think we will, we will come to that in the, in the second part of the evening as well. But No, I think yeah, it's important respond. to also add that I wasn't necessarily voicing my own standpoint. So in our classes, we are also still using Russian. Uh, but I was voicing a standpoint that I do see uh, voiced by many Russian famous writers and poets. And some have this less than others. Some say, why should I care? I should keep using this language. But it's an issue that does keep popping up. And then sometimes this argument, uh, which some people do bring up, is it's difficult for me to now speak Russian because it feels to me like it's the language of an aggressor. Uh, but indeed, Russian language is, of course, so much more, which is why it's very important to have this journal. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, that this magazine is called The Fifth Wave also because of the lots of waves of, of, of immigrants uh, throughout the decades. Um, is that something that also forms a culture or uh, a writer's group or a literature? Yes, you told me that you wanted to talk about that question tonight and then I started looking for this evening in, into, into those waves and and also laughing at some point because I thought, whoa, it's more like an ongoing stream. The first wave is, I think, late 1910s and 1920s in the wake of the revolution and the civic war. Then in the time of World War II, okay, there's a, there is a small breath between those. But then the third wave is the 1950s to 1980s with a peak in the 70s. Then the downfall of the Un Soviet Union, the fourth. And many uh, estimates say that that wave actually continued until the early 2020s when the fifth wave started with uh, yeah, uh, a full-fledged invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. So when you see them in a row, it's almost not waves, <laughs> but it's, it's more like never one stops. vast stream well, yeah. with, with a few peaks, of course, yeah. and ups and downs. Um, and then I also started indeed thinking about what does that do then to, I don't know, a language or a culture. What I find interesting is that in scholarship on literary uh, Russian uh, migrant writing, more recent scholarship, uh, for instance, by Maria Rubins, uh, she published a really interesting study on this topic, says, well, we used to think very much of emigrant writing as writing that speaks back to the homeland or where you feel nostalgia for the homeland as this sort of unified unit. But I think just like you were just underscoring, Maxime, Japan, Israel, etc. in this new scholarship, there are several scholars in this volume that I mentioned who really try to show how emigrant Russian literature is transnational by default and by definition. So it's always a literature in which many different local and national contexts come together, just like we are now discussing fifth wave in Amsterdam, but there are submissions of writers in it from writers who live in yet other countries. And this cultural hybridity 
and the fact that these literary cultures are, are by definition transnational, that they soak up other cultures, this is, I think, very important for these uh, migrant communities. They bring that back to, well, again, there is not one Russia, but they bring this back to many communities, I think, also in Russia. So this very transnational dimension of migrants, um, of, of literary emigration, all these literary emigration waves, I think is very important for um, also, well, what we think of as Russian culture yeah. or the many mm -hmm. uh, different local cultures that we have in Russia. Very interesting. And the last thing that I want to ask you is you founded also the University of New Europe, yes. um, which is maybe has a similar goal as the fifth wave uh, to support scholars and uh, to keep them working. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think some of our objectives are uh, overlap. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't publish literary writing. We do have our own book series. So in tw 2021, with the protests in Belarus, uh, the civic protests in Belarus, I felt very frustrated about those protests, and I thought, what should I do? And then together with colleagues, we started pleading for a new Euro European university, a new university which would allocate ample spaces to scholars and students and cultural workers from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and we still believe this is very important because the number of scholars and students on the run is enormous and it will continue to be enormous for years. Um, but this longer-term goal turns out to really be a longer-term thing, so you cannot found a university in one or two years. <laughs> so we're still working and lobbying with that. We are in close contact with, with colleagues from the European Union uh, about it. But while we're doing that, we have some short-term initiatives, including a book series, lecture series, but also a mentor program. Um, e even some of the, the uh, people uh, related to your journal writers are part of that mentor program. And what does that do, uh, that mentor program? Yeah. Uh, it's very simple, and I also want to recommend it to people here who may know people in need or potential mentors. It has this very simple idea that behind every scholar or student in need, um, there is someone. So there is another person, a high-profile scholar, uh, Judith Butler is a mentor too. We have some very famous mentors, but it can also be uh, a good assistant or associate professor here in Amsterdam. And this mentor then helps the mentee um, with writing grant applications, strengthening their network. Uh, we now have 350 mentees and wow. an equal amount of mentors. In some cases, the connections don't work, so <laughs> this is difficult. We're a small Still volunteer yeah. team, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, we have several occasions where people got jobs or full-time jobs, permanent jobs, uh, and where they really said, without the mentor, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So if you know someone who could be a mentor, if you want to be a mentor, please, uh, it's very simple. Our website is neweurope.university, or you can email me. Uh, and if you know someone in need, please tell them, and we will be very happy. Signing up is also very easy, and it's all cyber secure, so to say. So we're, we're very concerned about security. Very important, of course. Yes. Thank you so much, Ellen, for now. I think uh, we will hear a lot more uh, from the gentleman later, and uh, perhaps you also want to engage in the conversation then. But thank you for now. Thank Thanks. you for being here. <laughs> and I will now give the floor to Michel Krilars. He's a writer and journalist who spent also uh, a great time a great in Russia. Uh, he has written something uh, for us uh, that he's going to read. Please give him a warm applause. I'm probably one of the few who read the magazine. I started in Russian, but because I'm lazy, I continued in English. And of course, I wanted to, to, to write an extensive review about it. But then suddenly, it was um, time for the newspaper to go to the printers. And I decided to write my weekly column about it which I will read to you. This week, the first issue of Fifth Wave was published by Van Oorschot Publishers. It is a literary quarterly featuring uncensored literature from Russia, available in both English and Russian editions. Its founder is the Russian writer Maxim Osipov, whom I greatly admire because I know of no other writer who portrays the chaos the corruption and the lawlessness in his country so effectively without being merciless to his characters. Osipov fled Russia shortly after the invasion of Ukraine 
and ended up in Amsterdam. In collaboration with his, Dutch, with his Dutch publisher, the idea for a new literary magazine for so-called forbidden writers was born. With Russia experiencing its fifth wave of emigration in the 20th century and the suppression of free speech, there was a need for such a publication. Van Oerschot has a tradition of upholding Russian human rights activism and dissident literature. Since the early 1970s, they have published numerous books by Russian writers that were banned in their own country. F funding for these publications was received, among other sources, from the Alexander Herzen Foundation, which was established in 1969 by Russia experts Karel van der Dreven, Jan Willem Bezemer, and Peter Redaway, with the aim of publishing dissident Soviet literature in the West. The spirit of the Alexander Herzen Foundation seems to have been revived, revived half a century later, just as Russia has been thrown back 50 years in time due to the war in Ukraine. It is evident in the poems and stories in the first issue of Fifth Wave. They touch on the war, albeit in passing, just as in Turgenev's On the Eve, where the character of Ingarov goes to fight against the Turks, but unfortunately dies during his voyage to Bulgaria. The best story in the magazine is Incarcerated, written by Vasily Antipov, born in 1982. It is a sarcastic and simultaneously entertaining account of Belarusian prisons and psychiatric clinics. The narrator ends up there after being arrested with a few grams of amphetamines at the Polish border. He is in pre-trial detention, but thanks to prison doctor, who is called Miss Mangala, his stay is a living hell. When he speaks about the Belarusian justice system, he says it does not exist to discover the truth or to be just, but rather to warehouse people, to lock them up. Humanity has been replaced by sadism. His only solace comes from the books of Flaubert, Stendhal, Remarque, Gunter Grass, which he finds in the prison library. When Russia invades Ukraine on February 24, 2022, and jubilant news is broadcasted on the radio in the prison cells for three days, only a minority of three prisoners get angry. The majority is in favor of Putin, is in favor of the war. They shrug their shoulders, and Antipov beautifully describes how the ce celebratory news on the radio suddenly fades away, replaced by the usual advertisement. In Karina Aruchonova's story, The Color of War and the Color of Peace, there is also a passing mention of the war when she writes, winter began while we were waiting to be killed according to schedule. And the poem by Yuri Gogolev is about a young man who had a bright future ahead, but ends up on the battlefield without legs and without a head, with a hole in his right side. Dissident literature is, in short, very much alive and of high quality. Read Fifth Wave. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Michelle. And please do have a seat here um, for the next part of the program. And also a very warm welcome to Maxim Ozipov, writer, founder of the Fifth Wave. Uh, on the, the other side of uh, Michelle, if you want. Um, because I also want to announce that uh, Frederike Doppenberg and Menno Hartmann from uh, Van Oorschot Publishing will be uh, interviewing our two honored guests. Please welcome them as well. Gentlemen, let's talk. <laughs> let's start 
uh, with the birth of the magazine uh, and the sense of urgency you, Maxime, felt when we first started planning this magazine. Um, I remember very clearly um, uh, there's something you said during the process that really struck a chord with me. Um, we were endlessly discussing the, the layout and the design of the magazine and you sighed and said, guys, I'm on a completely different timeline. I'm in a hurry. Uh, could you elaborate on that sense of urgency you felt while making the magazine? Uh, well, uh, like most decisions in my life, at least mine, but I think in your lives too, uh, n the most important were made uh, not in a full, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, clarity of uh, of the mind. Uh, so I can easily explain why I bought, uh, say, Subaru and not Toyota, although they are all the same. But I can hardly explain why I picked up, you know, my medical profession, why I started writing, why I got married, why whatever. So the tendency uh, of immigrant in general is to say yes to everything when he uh, comes to, to a new land. Uh, and, well, Amsterdam was not completely new for me. I was there and we met uh, with Mann and Mark already. But uh, <coughs> in my new uh, situation, I tended to say yes to, to all ideas uh, that I heard. Like, uh, I went to, do you want to go to Concert Gibau? Sure, of course, without asking who will play and what will be played. Uh, I have visited a, a football game of Feyenoord with someone, I forgot the, the name, <laughs> by the same reason, you know, I just said yes. Uh, and, you know, someone uh, called me one day, uh, sent me a message saying, do you want to have a ride in a boat uh, through the, uh, you know, channels here? And said, sure, of course. And who are you? She said, I'm, I'm a pathologist from Amsterdam University. Of course, I, I would like to meet a pathologist. Uh, so, <laughs> when Mano and uh, Mark came to, 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 you know, to see me at the first day of my arrival to Amsterdam, they said, uh, here is an idea. Why don't we start uh, a magazine uh, together in Russian and in English, both in uh, paper and electronic form, whatever. And I said, do I, like, would I be a publisher again? Because I was a publisher for, for many years, but I did huge medical books uh, with a lot of you know tables and indexes and all this stuff. And they said yes. And I said yes, of course. And uh, is this also how you sourced the authors? They instantly say yes. To <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I, I must say that uh, I have some friends, and they they have friends, and we have. Uh, you know, certainly we have a number of very good poets uh, these days in Russia and abroad. Uh, prose is more difficult, but uh, still, there are people for whom uh, the idea of being uh, published uh, in this kind of magazine seem to be uh, interesting because, well, uh, because it's uncensored. Uh, they can speak freely, although even if you do not speak about the war. Uh, you, we, we have it in mind all the time, you know, day and night. Uh, so uh, this, you know, understanding that in principle you can be published in Russia, uh, but then you have to avoid certain words, uh, whatever, you know, for many people it's just unacceptable. Yeah, and mm -hmm. maybe we have discussed many things about this, this, this magazine and about uh, the authors as well, but what we never talked about was uh, the way they reacted to your uh, t telling them that you were going to, uh, to, to make this, 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 this magazine. What, what did it mean to them? Well, for some of them, uh, well, people tend not to confess that, you know, some of them, those who stay in Russia, for them, the risk may be too big, and they would they would not say we are afraid. Uh, 
but they would say, well, maybe, you know, let's discuss it, whatever. Uh, for those who live abroad, of course, they would be, uh, although some of them even, they have to go back and forth. For example, some writers have uh, elderly parents living in Moscow. They don't want to take, uh, you know, too much risk, whatever. But people would not discuss it with me, uh, only close friends, uh, very few. Uh, like, I don't have many, I mean, close friends, of course. So, uh, you know, uh, some of them, uh, some of them say let's postpone it and whatever, but uh, but most people just feel and and I, I I think there will be more and more submissions, uh, and there are some active submissions already. Uh, in the second volume, we will have a professor Bogen, his name from uh, Hamburg, who wrote about myth of the Soviet common Soviet people. Uh, very interesting. Uh, article. I would say I never heard his, his name before. He just you know, found the website and sent his, uh, his article to me. Uh, there is also a collection of uh, poems. Well, there are so many uh, bad poetry that I uh, read these days. Uh, but, uh, but, you say, uh, yes. Among, huh? <laughs> yeah. But, but among uh, this bad poetry, we found something really <laughs> really uh, worth publishing too. That's consolation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's worth reading uh, submissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michel, uh, you must still speak to uh, friends uh, or uh, writers you met during your stay in Russia as a correspondent. Uh, what is your experience with um, uh, how are they living this period of time? Oh, it's very interesting because in, in the, the first uh, year of the war, it was very easy to, 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 to be in contact with them, to phone them and to ask how they were feeling and the majority of them all used uh, anti-depressive uh, uh, medicine. But um, what happened in the beginning of May, a few days before the celebration of the, the war parade in Moscow, I spoke to my best friend, and uh, she used to, to be my assistant during my correspondency dates. And uh, she started to give a sort of a lecture about the restoration of German farms in the Kaliningrad area. And she didn't stop telling about it. And then I suddenly real realized that she didn't want to talk about herself anymore. So maybe she thought FSB was uh, uh, listening. They were uh, eavesdropping on their telephone. That's scary. And it was scary. And I, w I was told by several others that they also have this fear nowadays. I don't know if, if it's true, but people in Moscow, they are, are afraid. So they are the more afraid is, than they were a year ago. Day. Yeah. Maxim, is it important for you uh, to know that uh, people in Russia can read this review? Yes, uh, of course, because m the majority of readers uh, is still in, in Russia, in, because it's, it's a big country. And uh, so we, there is no way they can buy it. Uh, credit cards and all this, you know, things, they, they do not work. Uh, so, uh, we provide a free access to the magazine, to the electronic version of the magazine, to those who live in Russia, in Ukraine, and Belarus. Uh, so they can uh, load electronic version from, the, from my website in Russian, obviously. Uh, so there are, there are a few categories of readers, of course. Uh, the biggest one is in Russia. Uh, the second biggest is immigrants. Uh, you know, that are spread these days, you know, elsewhere in United States, in Israel, in Germany, in 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 Baltic states, in Poland, wherever. Uh, and the third category is um, uh, Slavists, uh, specialists. You know, it is the smallest one, but they used to buy uh, magazines <laughs> more often than anyone else. Uh, so these are uh, three groups, major groups of, of our readers, I guess. 
So there's a very large diaspora of uh, Russians abroad. Michel, um, are you aware of any other initiative like this worldwide somewhere uh, making review lit lit actually, literature? Uh, no. No. no, actually this is the first, I'm, I'm, I'm reading lots of, of uh, press on, on the developments of, of also of the literary world. But I think this well, is I the know, first. Well, I know about a couple initiatives, oh. Oh. The, not, not, I mean, not exactly the same. It's ROAR, the uh, uh, magazine of Lenor Garalik in Israel. It's for poetry uh, and it's free of charge and it's on, on web. Uh, and also Chkartyashvili um, uh, made uh, Akunin, our famous, you know, detective story writer, uh, made uh, a also on, on the web, uh, the, the sort of free magazine for, you know, for Russian writers. So it exists, yeah, something. But, I mean, not the same. <coughs> well, I was, and I was thinking that uh, Barry Sakunin, the detective writer, I saw him taking part in this uh, this meeting at the European Parliament last Monday, uh, uh, a meeting by the Russian opposition, and he's taking part with uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky mm -hmm. and Boris uh, Gudkov, uh, several other people who fled the country after uh, already for for a few years ago. And uh, he is also taking part in it. And it's always interesting when a writer takes part in active, and, and they, they call themselves, the, the, the name of the conference was the day after. So what will we do if Putin uh, is gone? Mm -hmm. We will celebrate. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and day after we'll have a headache. Uh, <laughs> that I know for sure. <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering, Alan was speaking before that you hate the word dissident to be used in this context. But do you feel in any way connected to that period of time? Well, uh, this is sort of a, uh, we call it, you know, uh, to say in Russian, well, uh, there is a Russian word, dissidente, uh, which is not the same as English one. So the English word dissidence is one who disagrees. Uh, in Russia, we used this word, uh, this term as for a person who was prosecuted, who suffered, who was imprisoned, who fought actively. So to say I am a dissident, it is similar to say I am a hero. You know, it's something the person would never say about himself, right? Even dissidents, uh, you know, it's, it's something. Uh, so in English, I got used to be called dissident because I definitely disagree with what is going on. Uh, so that was my initial uh, reaction to this uh, term. And as for real dissidents, uh, my family was quite close with many of them, and uh, they were friends. Uh, and uh, you know, I, like Alexander Ginsburg, uh, Toli, Anatoly Kapson was a friend of my father, very close, and many others. Uh, so in my childhood, I was I was kind of, you know, uh, I saw these people. Uh, but I myself was not involved in any political uh, activity, of course, because I was too small at that time. Uh, so that's... Mm -hmm. uh, Michel, you, on the other hand, use dissident freely <laughs> in your column. Uh, do you see any um, overlap between that generation and this generation of writers? Uh, no, no, uh, until this day, those writers are not persecuted. And in the Soviet times, they were. So actually, there's no overlap. And it's also funny because what M Maxim says, he, he won't use the word dissident. Actually, it's a word the Western journalists and uh, uh, Russian scholars invented, maybe. Uh, no, I, actually, I don't see it. Because it's very interesting that two of the poets in, in the first volume they are still living in Moscow. And when you read it closely, the, their text, it, con it contains critic, critics. Uh, yeah. It's critical yeah. on the war, and actually they all are a mm -hmm. bit, not openly, but you can you can feel, you can sense their their opposition against it. 
Yeah. And uh, though uh, very subtle in a way, but clear. Yes, and no, I, Google I, is uh, not even uh, subtle. It's very no, clear. It's very clear. clear. That's clear. And yeah, it's yeah, also yeah, very yeah. interesting because I, uh, a few months ago I interviewed uh, the Russian film critic uh, Anatoly Dorlin, and he fled to Riga. And he's a very famous man. He told me he has a, a YouTube channel with a million subscribers who pay a dollar a week or something. So he must be, be must have become very rich. And he told me that. He has got very many acquaintances in high government circles. And he told me, actually, Putin and his cronies, they aren't interested in culture at all mm. nowadays. So they, uh, writers, etc. Yeah, Evgeny Berkovich, she has been imprisoned uh, recently for her literary work. That's an exception, yeah. It yeah, will, of course. Yeah. Well, it is an exception, but yeah, yeah, but it's different. And so far, uh, well, uh, if if it is possible in principle, uh, then you know, there is, of course, uh, and and telling uh, you know this uh, Dolin story, uh, the, there is a big difference between uh, Sovietska власть, you know, Soviet power, and uh, between Putin's power. Because uh, Stalin was really interested in everything. He, he would be interested in who is the best ballet dancer. Is it Lipishinska or is it Ulanova? Uh, who is the best pianist? Is it Gilil or is it Richter? You know? And he would never say, no, no, I'm not interested in, in piano you know, performance. No. The, the, the Communist Party was interested in every aspect. Uh, Putin is, you know, he's uh, he's really a a, uh, a I wouldn't say small criminal. He's a very big criminal, but but his uh, psychology uh, and his uh, uh, you know his idea is to keep his own power. And as far as you know, print runs are small. So why would be he would be interested in in a small group of people who are uh, who who will not never be happy with him anyway? No so no, yeah, no. so he would be interested in television, in you know movies, in in some mass culture. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I was f very f very impressed by the literary quality of this this review. Mm -hmm. you, you told me that uh, maybe for the next volume it it would be slightly a bit more political. Is that something you mm -hmm. intend it to be, or uh, do you want it to become slightly more political? No, well, uh, well, the major, the, the biggest publication of the second volume is not really political, although, you now, what is, I mean, it is political in a way, uh, because it's, uh, it's Alexei Tsvitkov, our maybe greatest poet of, uh, who, who died last year, who was very strong anti-Putin person, etc., uh, and who was uh, who left Russia in 1975 because of uh, KGB. Uh, you know, he was he was a dissident actually, uh, and he was not punished only because he was a really a cripple. He was a uh, he had tuberculosis of bones and he was really crippled, uh, and uh, so he was able to leave. Uh, but this is not really political in, in the sense it's not about the war, about poetry. Uh, but we have very good story. Well, we have uh, poems of Birkovich, which is political. We have Yashin, who is uh, very political, obviously, although he is talking about prison in its most, you know, even funny aspects. It, it, there are sketches uh, from the prison with some anecdotes even. Uh, we have very good uh, story. I'm happy to have this dimension uh, that I yeah, I asked a uh, arch priest uh, from uh, his name is Andrei Kordichkin. He lives in Madrid uh, and he wrote a very frank and very very interesting story about about the church and its role and you know uh, it's a very good story too. Uh, so there are political and non-political things. Uh, so it's, but at that time for us, everything is somehow political. It's, uh, 
uh, it's uh, coming back to this, uh, to your first question about time. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the sense of time is totally changed, really. Uh, I lived so many lives myself this year, mm -hmm. you know, that I would never uh, expect uh, in the past. Yeah. <laughs> maybe we have. Yeah, maybe it's maybe time some, for questions yeah, from the audience. From the audience would like something. I have a microphone, so I come to you if you have a question. Thank you. Uh, I have a question on the title, because you know titles mean a lot, of course. My first association was with the fifth wave, was not, you explained with the different mm -hmm. waves of immigration, but my first association was with the fifth column. Uh, well, and, it's... Uh, and that... <laughs> okay, course, I, I was, I was I expecting that uh, from from totally different side of the, <laughs> I would say, of the spectrum, uh, of political spectrum. But, that, of course, it could be... It could be uh, I, I, I don't think maybe it was in your subconscious. <laughs> but that, that, that brings me to my real question is, what impact do you expect or do you hope to have with this magazine uh, impact? Like, what are you, are you hoping for that it will contribute to some change in Russia? Mm. Or what is your expectation or your hopes? Okay. Well, so about the title, I think the title is very obvious to all Russians who would uh, read it because we, uh, it is used wildly and uh, clearly Everyone would understand it's not about windsurfing or you know some somewhat else, uh, but it's fifth wave of immigration, of course. And in English, we have this uh, independent Russian writing, so again, it's clear uh, what it is about. And uh, as for impact, no, I don't think. Well, it's uh, I forgot who 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 said that. What's the worth of the poetry if even the the window doesn't break when you when you, you know, the glass doesn't break when you read it well it's uh, it's indirect always like impact of arts uh, and uh, these days of course it's uh, you know uh, it's ukrainian army uh, it's uh, help of the of the west uh, these are major factors that uh, really would have impact on on what is going on. Not not Russian literature. I think uh, for us, you know, humility is the word uh, we are we are looking for uh, here. But of course, I hope it will it will serve something something good. But of course, very in in very indirect way. Sorry, yeah. Um, um, in connection to this question, I would like to ask if you cons uh, considered perhaps also working with Russian publishing houses, even though it's very difficult in Russia at the moment. It's not impossible. A lot is happening under uh, Patpolia. Uh, under what? Underground. <laughs> Sorry, ah, underground. Uh -huh. um, so, and on Telegram, uh, a lot is going on. Telegram is not forbidden in Russia, 40 million uh, readers in Russia at the moment. So there are many ways, I think, to, to, to disperse this great initiative and to have a big audience also in Russia. Mm -hmm. Did you? Well, I, I hired the, uh, a lady who is doing so-called SMM. I am not good myself in Instagram, Telegram, whatever, and she's supposed to you know, spread the word. Uh, and uh, talking about publishing houses, it's it's paradoxical situation because they are still working, and uh, this year, uh, in August, actually quite soon, my the whole collection of my works will be published in Russian, by the publisher, a, a good friend of mine, uh, who lives in Greece, and she's a wife of a very well known dissident, Sergei Parhomenko, a, a journalist, Varya uh, Garnastaeva. And she's my uh, classmate from very long, uh, you know, we haven't seen each other for like 40 years or something. And she offered uh, me that because I will turn 
we both will turn with her 60 this year. And she said, I would like to, to, to make you a gift and, and publish me in Moscow. And it is so, it was so strange and unexpected. Uh, but the book will be there. Who knows? I don't know where I see it actually. But uh, I receive uh, emails and you know PDFs, and I make corrections, uh, discuss uh, cover with the. It's a strange world, uh, really, a very strange world we live in. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a small, very practical question, but and I'm sorry I can't check right now because I only have the English version here. But I really enjoyed, I read some parts of the text. I didn't yet manage simply because I saw mm -hmm. it too, too late to, to read full stories. But something that I really enjoyed was, I think, the opening contribution of the Russian volume by Lena Benson, uh, Stichy. And then I was looking for the English version, and it's mm -hmm. not there, right? Yeah. The, and I thought maybe other, there. it sounds very particular now, but other people might wonder if they lay to see two versions. Why? <laughs> uh, because a uh, translator found it intranslatable. <laughs> No, po with poetry, well, with poetry, no, look, with poetry, there was, yeah, well, or two, two poems of Gugliff out of uh, seven or eight. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, they picked up something that they thought, the, uh, there was a very nice group of translators uh, led by uh, my very good friend, Boris Draluk, who is a very good translator. And he gave it to 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 best people in the field, and they said, "Okay, I will pick this, pick this." So no one picked uh, picked uh, Birson. Yeah, of course. Yes. So in the future, I think. Well, it's mm, better you you answer that question. But yeah, in the future, we will probably have selections. Yeah, true. Here. Because the Russian edition will be published four times a year, and the English edition, two times. Yeah, true. No, it's not. I mean, really, a digest. It's uh, some some uh, uh, pieces. Uh, well, if they are translated, they are translated in full. But with poetry, you know, it's uh, uh, the the choice was to make it verlieber instead of uh, something. Uh, and you know, the I guess the translator just uh, said, "No, I I don't take it." Uh, yeah, we trusted him. Yeah, we trusted. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> From Moscow. F from from where? Uh, I live in London, but originally from uh, Moscow. Uh -huh. So I have a question: If you still stay in Moscow in the moment of book fair in uh, Red Square, you will be participate in this book fair or not? No, I never actually participated in this book fair. But uh, what I do you think about the uh, author who, who participated? Now it was two weeks ago. Yeah, I, I even didn't know about that, but I think, of course, none of my friends would participate in such a book fair, no. And I, I really, well, uh, no, it's not a good idea to participate in this book fair because you, uh, one thing is, uh, well, recently I had a question from a friend, uh, a pianist, who lives in uh, Germany. And he asked me, uh, he said, I'm invited to play in Skrebin Museum in Moscow, which is not the, the biggest hall, but still, it's at the very center of Moscow, etc. Uh, would you go if, if you were me? He asked me, and I said, uh, no, I would not. Uh, although they would pay for tickets and for you know, uh, airplane and hotel and whatever. And he said, but I will play not for Putin, but for my uh, for my parents. And I said, well, one thing, if you go to their home and play for them there, another thing, if you play at the concert hall, uh, then it is an indirect way of supporting the war, like to saying, uh, you know, life is going on. Uh, so if I am asked, I would, but... Uh, Frankly speaking, if he goes there, it's not that I would stop shaking, uh, give him hand, whatever, to this pianist. 
I myself would not participate, I, and I didn't. After the invasion of Crimea, I decided not to participate in any uh, official organizations, actually. Uh, I was member of some medical uh, organizations, you know, and I, I quit and went to Tarusa, and, uh, but, you know, clearly it was not enough. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, we talked a little about um, your reading, your audience, let's say. Um, and I myself am part of the third group, the Slavist. Um, and I would just want to, well, I wanted to ask the editors and the founder on to maybe reflect on the choice to also offer the journal in English, because it's just why that language in particular and, and what are you hoping to maybe achieve with offering it in English as well? Uh, so the question is why it is translated into English? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. It's the biggest language in the world, right? Uh, and so why do we speak English now and not Japanese? <laughs> yeah, so uh, am I... Yes, am it's I? also... Uh, it makes it possible to uh, to communicate to other languages and other publishing houses to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get them started to be interested in, in the pieces we publish. So, and for a very simple reason is that uh, the two of us and the, th the, the people working at Van Orsfeld, we don't read Russian, so it's also a nice possibility to be, to, to be able to, uh, to read our own uh, uh, the fifth, fifth wave. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and well, why was I translated into Dutch. It happened only I, after I was translated into English myself, New York Review of Books, and you got PDF with my works, right? Yes. So it's, it's nowadays, I mean, because of, imper of imperialistic nature of British culture, I guess. <laughs> this is maybe a good moment to ask a, a very selfish question, but um, uh, you spend a lot of time editing this wonderful uh, fifth wave. Will there be a time that you are able to uh, write a beautiful story or a novel for yourself? Well, I, I hope so. Uh, well, right now, it's not lack of time, but the lack of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I still feel I'm running somewhere. Uh, so it's very hard to write while running. Uh, I mean, many, many things are going on with my family, with, uh, you know, some administrative stuff. Uh, it's, it's hard to even, you know, uh, I, I must say Amsterdam was very, I mean, uh, the Netherlands was very, very nice to me, exceptionally nice. I am very grateful. Uh, but still, of course, I need to figure out you know, how to do many, many things that I uh, didn't know. Clear. But I will. I will write. Thank you. Thank you. I can get an advance. <laughs> Talk about it later. Something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Hi. I'm Christina. Uh, I'm um, uh, living in Amsterdam here, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm Russian. Um, thank you very much for this uh, new modern version of the Samizdat, uh, Tamizdat, mm -hmm. uh, of this uh, new synthesis. And um, from our community, the Russian-speaking community in the Netherlands, I had already some questions how to participate. So are you um, accepting submissions? Yeah, yes. Uh, you can send us uh, an email. Uh, there is an email on the legal page uh, of the magazine, and there is an email on the uh, website, which is 5wave ru dot com uh, so you know they do like like many others mm -hmm. um, so my question uh, is about the space that Russian writers now inhibit and primarily do you think there's still uh, space to write freely, or do you believe that it's necessary to be politically engaged in all the writing? 
Um, so is it also possible for writers still to write about different topics than um, the political issues that are playing right now? Well, uh, again, what is what is political? Was my writing before the war non-political? No, it wasn't. I mean, it was very political uh, often. Even if we write about, you know, love or about nature, it's, it's you know, nature during the war. And still it's about human beings. I don't know. Maybe there are writers who can... Uh, who can write of someone else, but or pretend they they do. Uh, but uh, I have very, to tell you the truth, I have very little respect to those who uh, who do not, who is not political these days. It's like saying when your uh, your wife is going to you know deliver a, a child to say I am not interested in obstetrics. You know, it's so what does that mean? I mean, or to say I'm not interested in an oncology where your best friend is dying from cancer, right? It's uh, something impossible in my in my opinion. Well, I think if there are no further questions, um, it's time to baptize the magazine with a nice cold beer <laughs> afterwards. Um, so, thank you all for your well, contribution. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. And thanks, thanks to Dibali, it really became sort of second home for me. I'm, I'm very happy to be here again. <laughs>